All right. I had uh, lunch yesterday with a friend who is a physician. He's a physician. So I had lunch with him yesterday, and he wore an Astros shirt um, from the uh, World Series. And uh, so, uh, so I said to him, uh, I like your shirt. And he said, well, every time I wear this, they win. He said, the other night they didn't wear it and they lost. So he said, I'm wearing it today so they win. So they won. So this morning I said to him, now you've got to wear it for two weeks. You know, for the next week, you're going to have to wear it and just change deodorant or whatever. Right? So, so anyway. <laughs> anyway, we need them to win. Bring it back home. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that. Anyway. Uh, today is going to be a different kind of, of message. And so it's called Strength to Strength. Um, and um, so we're going to talk about it. You know, I, I talk to you every once in a while about training your mind. Uh, the mind is a, is a battleground. The spirit comes first. And you do not have to. I, I want to emphasize this. Um, I spent most of my life studying scripture and studying what um, God's word. And in looking at that, uh, sometimes people get mixed up. I want to tell you, you don't even have to read and write, and you'll still go to heaven because Jesus loves you, died for you, you accept his grace, done. <laughs> it's just that simple. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to know everything that is knowable. You, you just have to be his and have a relationship with him. Today we're going to talk about training of the mind. I think the mind is a very difficult place for all of us. I, it is for me. Mind is not a simple thing. It... it um, uh, it doesn't operate separate from us, though sometimes we think it does. Um, it is ours to train, to do with it what we want, to think the way we want to think. And uh, so you have to be very careful with that because you can get weird. You know, I told you that, um, you know, they, people tell you, just do confession. Just confess positive things all the time, and, and eventually that's going to happen in your life. So I tried it for six months. I declared myself a 45-year-old North Korean woman, and it didn't work out for me. I'm just, I'm telling you this. Oh, some of you get that. You know, it's not just positive confession that does it, though that's a big part of it. But when God talks to us about changing our mind, he needs to change the way he's thinking. That we look at Scripture a different way, that we study Scripture, and we realize how God created us, and in realizing how he created us, then we start thinking his kind of thoughts toward us. And I, I, that's very important. It's the reason why we study God's Word. You know why I still um, have to go to class and still study God's Word? You know why I have to do that? Because I leak. What I knew last week just sort of leaks out on this side over here, and I forgot it. And every once in a while I'll go, oh, I used to do that, I remember well, why don't you do it anymore? Well, I forgot. See, and this, is, this is the reason why we do Sunday school. This is the reason why we do classes. This is the reason why we read God's Word, because we want to think the way He thinks. Think His thoughts and be like Him. That's so important for us as human beings, because our thoughts get way off. I don't know about you, but my thoughts get off track a lot. I do this... Um, how about this one? I'm driving down the freeway, and I'm, I'm singing the songs to the radio. I'm, so I'm listening to the radio. I'm driving down the freeway, and my mind, without even thinking about it, I don't even have to concentrate on it anymore, it goes, there's a car coming up on your right. There, look at that left-hand mirror. There's a car over there, and there's a car coming. Get off my bumper. What is wrong with you back there? And your mind just takes off. Well, it does that. And you get to the place where you went, and you go, wait a minute, how did I get here? I already passed, I, I didn't know I passed that place. And your mind has been someplace else. Now, it's dangerous when you're driving. I'll let you know. But our, all our minds do that. And every once in a while, you have to say to your own head, stop, focus, pay attention. And that's all I'm telling you with this. Stop, focus, and pay attention to God's Word because it's different than the way we think. You think you know? Think differently. And that is the word repent, by the way. Uh, we go over this often, too, here. Uh, 
Repent means to change your mind, to change the way you're thinking. You're thinking one way and you find out, oh, that's wrong. Then you start thinking another. And today's sermon is all about that. So uh, we'll look at the scriptures. Um, The title of the sermon is Strength to Strength. And you'll get this in a minute because halfway through I'm going to go over the scripture that says that. But the, the, the title is Strength to Strength. But it ought to be from digging holes to digging the next hole. Or it ought to be from from mud to mud or or slosh to slosh or muck to muck, whatever you want to call it. But God called it strength to strength, so we need to pay attention when he changes the the thought on this. Then we need to do strength to strength too. And so we'll get into that in a minute. First is uh, I'm going to talk to you about Psalms 84. I want to go through it. And we're going to do the title first. Listen to the title now. If I was in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall, I might say, I wouldn't say the number, because all the people at the Wailing Wall with me, all Jews, if they were all Jewish, they would have every psalm memorized. I don't. So, <laughs> just to let you know, I don't, I don't have all the psalms memorized. But they would know, they would know this title, to the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah. They would know that. And they start off at the Wailing Wall, and they'll read the first line. And then you'll hear them mumbling or total silence, and they'll just be rocking back and forth. And they will, in their head, be repeating the psalm. And then they'll get to the last line, and they'll say it out loud again. Everybody around them knows it's Psalm 84 because they know Psalm 84. They don't have to announce it like that. But the title that they give this to the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the songs of Korah. Powerful statement, and just that historical designation. So I want to go over that first. Chief musician. So they wrote this and gave it to Perucho. He's the chief musician in the church, in case you didn't know. They give it to him, and they go, here's a poem, get after it. And I want this instrument, really more than an instrument, I want this, this uh, rhythm pattern in this song or the instrument of Gath, either one. But I want this rhythm pattern. Make sure you get this rhythm pattern in here. So the poetry writer has input to the chief musician. A psalm of the sons of Korah. Now, Korah in the Old Testament um, was a rebellious person. He, he, he mounted a rebellion and organized it in, against Moses and Aaron. And... Uh, the way they laid it out, the tabernacle was in the center every night. They'd pick it up, fold it up, move it, and then they'd put it in the center. And then they'd raise their tents around it in the same spot every night. That way they had streets and they had alleys and everybody knew where everybody's tent was. Moses was very much a genius in this. He was a civil engineer trained by the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was very smart. So he knew where every family was. And this was not a small group. This was probably about a million people counting children and everything in the middle of the desert. And every night he could tell you where everybody was because he'd know where their tent was because the way they laid it out. And they did this for 40 years in the wilderness. Every night they'd pick up the tent, they'd move it, and the same street would be in a different location, same alleyway. So Korah left his house on one side of the tabernacle, went to the other side of the tabernacle to meet with two friends that decided that Moses and Aaron weren't good enough. They could do it better. And sometimes we feel that way too. But Korah went over there and has, he was practicing. It was over the incense. He didn't like the way Aaron did the incense. So he created his own incense and was going to give it to God. So he lit the incense on fire. And when he did, the Bible called it strange fire. And God was not pleased. And the Bible says that when they lit the fire, a sinkhole happened underneath the tents. And those two families just disappeared. They fell in the hole. And, and then the incense, I guess, caught on fire, and, and God was displeased, and, and, and the tents began to burn. And so from that point on, Korah was not a wonderful name. Uh, you can hear it, parents. You can hear parents go, I don't want you to go over to Korah's house. You know what happened to his. You know what happened to him. 
He just one day, it disappeared and his house fell in. So you don't be playing with his kids. You stay away from them. You can hear that, right? There's generations later, the kingdom of David, and here Korah's sons are writing praises to God. David was the first. This is just trivia. None of you know. You don't have to know this to go to heaven. So, um, uh, this, so this is just biblical trivia. David was the first recorded male musician in church. He's a, uh, in the Bible, he's the first one who sang, first man who sang. There were women who sang songs, but not men. And David was the first man recorded. Doesn't mean he was the first man that sang. He was the first man that's recorded to sing. And he also hired musicians to sing in the tabernacle. Now, just because he did that doesn't mean Perucho can ask for a raise. You got that? Okay, so, so we just make it clear. Just getting it clear here. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, but that, you know, this, these are just interesting things. Here are the sons of Korah. Their father, their grandfather, their great-great-grandfather had bad history. And yet here the redemption is they wrote psalms to God. Wow. What that says to you and me is I didn't have a bad history. My daddy could have done something that harmed others. He could have murdered somebody. He could have been in prison. He could have done something bad. My mama may not have been a good mama. And that's not true in my family, but I could say that. I could say my mama may not have been a good mama, but God still has redemption for me. He still has forgiveness for me. So regardless of your parentage or your heritage, God has something for you. Just you and nobody else. Sons of Korah. Well, they wrote this poem. So I'm going to read this poem to you. It always reminds me of my childhood. My childhood, I grew up in southeast Houston. My father pastored a church that was in the old city of Manchester, which is now part of Houston, on the, the, the ship basin there. And the big bridge, the big bridge that goes over, 610 bridge that goes over the, the ship channel, my dad's church was right at the bottom of that. And when I was a little bitty, um, we were pretty poor, and we lived in the church. And I used to watch the birds, uh, little sparrows, they're not worth anything. They were southeast side of Houston, just full of them eating mosquitoes. And these little sparrows would would make holes in the church and they'd fly in and they'd live in the church and sometimes they'd be in the church flying around during service it was a lot of fun when he was preaching and everybody's paying attention to the bird not to him but anyway anyway so this psalm always reminds me of that and you'll get it in the first section here it's written in three sections um, and so i'm going to read the first one how lovely is your tabernacle O lord of hosts My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. You can hear the desire of the sons of Korah's heart. Even the sparrow has found a home. Even the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah. Now, that Selah or Selah means to, there's no real translation for it. What it means is, wow, that was a terrific thought. Let's stop and think through that one more time. So look at it. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they'll be praising you. It's a good thing to come to church. That's what that says. Let's think about that. Second section goes like this. And, and I'm going to, it's got a say lie at the end of it, and I'm going to go back through it, and we are going to pause and think about it. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pool. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Say lie. And then this last one is a little happier. We, we, um, when we were younger, this was put to music, and we used to sing this. Twyla and I used to sing this. O oh God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed for a day in your courts. And, and even you guys sang a song like this. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. 
I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. That middle section, now we're going to go back and we're going to go through it and think about it a little more. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. You know, there's some times when, uh, when I do things, uh, you know, and I, I don't know. I don't know how this works. But I wanted when I was younger for everything I did to be successful. I had this drive that everything I did, I wanted it to be wildly successful. And I'd push and push hard. And you know, when you do that, sometimes it turns out the way you want, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a big disappointment. You know, there are days even now when, I, when I'm working away and I work hard at something, I really try with a person or with a family, and it's like, <laughs> dud. Nothing. And then there are other days when, when it seemed like I just said good morning to that person, and they're telling me, oh, that was so wonderful. I thank you so very much. And I'm like, what? Yeah, have you ever noticed that? Somehow that strength is in me then. And I'm looking for that strength to come from me, whether I'm success or, or failure. I don't want to use God as an excuse. I should be doing right all the time. All the time I should be doing right and not give up. But there's something about having my strength in him and not having that strength in me. Blessed is the man or the woman whose strength is in the Lord. And they see something happening. It's the Lord who's doing that through us. It's him. And not so much pressure on me, not so much worry about failure or success, but the strength of God. All right. So blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. The pilgrimage would be, uh, if you take a pilgrimage, you're walking with God. So think about it in that way. Whose, whose heart is that I want to walk with the Lord. This is his drive for, for life. I want to walk with the Lord. As they pass through the valley of Baca, now, the Valley of Baca, if you find it on a map, it doesn't really exist. But nevertheless, there are people who have tried to find where the Baca was. Somebody says it's a wilderness above Jerusalem. Another one says, no, no, it's, it's actually in Saudi Arabia where Baca is. But, but it doesn't matter. It, let's say it's allegorical for a moment because this is a poem. The word Baca means sorrow or weeping. In other words, when this man on pilgrimage walking with God goes through sorrow or pain in his life, you can be very godly and you'll face pain. You'll face sorrow. It's just part of this life. And when you're in the middle of it, you think, oh my goodness, how's this going to turn out? And you can see this pilgrim, I, you know, Twyla and I didn't know how hot it could be <laughs> in, uh, in Israel. It was uh, 114, 115 one day, and we were, there was no, there was nothing. There was no shade, no tree, no nothing. The valley of Baca for me, the sorrow, the pain of being in that spot. Okay, it wasn't that much suffering, but nevertheless, you get it. You may be going through Baca right now. Something in your life may be hurting you. Something in your life may not be going the way you think it ought to go. And you're feeling sorrow or pain. That's Baca. I have a friend named David Reaver who was my counselor when I was a child. His parents really were wonderful to me in my um, developing ministry. They, they um, used to advise me some, and I appreciated every bit of it. His mother was a very godly person. But David, David uh, was a, he got drafted to Vietnam Navy SEAL was on a PT boat, um, and um, a bullet um, uh, pierced a phosphorus grenade in his hand and burned him beyond recognition. He lost a, uh, he didn't have an ear, he had a plastic ear when, when he used, we used to travel with him some, and he'd have a plastic ear, and he'd take that ear off, and he'd plink on the piano, and he'd go, eerie music. Oh, put your ear back on, quit it. 
but he lost fingers on both hands. And if you've ever heard his testimony, it's powerful. And he does stuff with military veterans now, those who are wounded. And David is a powerful, powerful speaker. He used to speak on the Valley of Baca in his own life. And he would tell the things that happened to him, that sorrow, that deep pain that he felt. Because he gave up everything, went to Vietnam. And when he came back, people were mad at Vietnam vets during that time. And he wasn't acceptable in society. And he talks about it that way, that hurt, that sorrow, that pain in his own life. Well, this person who's a pilgrim walking with God, whose heart is after the Lord, who, who wants everything to turn out right, is now in the midst of sorrow. And then he, he, he digs this pool in the middle of the desert, this pool. He, he digs down until there's moisture. And whether this really happened ever, the idiom that they, they are looking at here, the, the story that is told is that he hits this moisture and he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's just there for that day walking through Baca. And he takes off the next day and he's left this empty pool. And maybe the autumn rains come, if you read it. Maybe the autumn rains come and fill the pool. And if, it, if the timing's just right, then all of a sudden that becomes an oasis in the middle of a desert for somebody else. Now listen very carefully at this. In your worst day, you doing good will show up. In your worst day, don't get discouraged if you did something and no one's giving you credit for it. In your worst day, don't give up on God because God has a lot to do with this. In the valley of Baca, in the valley of weeping and sorrow, if you leave something behind for someone else, someone's going to pick it up. The New Testament says it this way. Now, this is, this is a quotation, Johnson translation, whatever. It says that signs and wonders follow them that believe. This is Jesus talking to us. Signs and wonders follow them that believe. What happens here is I want signs and wonders to precede me. Now, hear me, hear me here. I want them to be ahead of me because I want people to know when I walk in the room, it's me. I am here. I can handle this for you. See, that's what I want. But that, that isn't what the Scripture says. It says, they follow me. I do my stuff. I dig the pool. God fills the rain. People may, it may be so far till people don't even know I've been there. What a wonderful oasis and how pretty and comfortable it is here. Wait, I went through great pain to get that there. They don't even know who I am. Signs and wonders follow them that believe, but we keep on doing this in the name of God. We keep on doing what we're supposed to do. God will bless. God will reward. Listen, let's go on with this. Valley of weeping or a hard time. The rain covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Now get this pilgrim. He's in the middle of this valley, desert, and he's digging a hole for water. And it rained in, there in three years in that spot. But he's digging this hole for water just in case the autumn rains hit. So he digs this hole, and the next day he's at a new spot digging another hole. And here God says, this is from strength to strength. See, me, I'm thinking about it, and that'd be from drudgery to drudgery, from digging one hole to the next hole, from stupid stuff, just digging a hole and going on to the next hole and digging it again. The church went through this not long ago. We, uh, we decided to help a family, and uh, I don't know, it just didn't turn out. I mean, the family actually took the money and didn't use it for what it was supposed to be used for, for their children. And uh, it was very disappointing, and people were down that were involved in this. And they were going, oh, we misused the Lord's money. But, and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, no. No one's going to talk bad about us because we're doing what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to help the poor. We are supposed to help children who need it. We are supposed to do this. So no one's going to talk down to us because someone ripped us off and someone lied to us. That is not what we do. 
we keep going along. We keep digging that pool. We keep doing what we're supposed to do, what God has called us to do. When you become faithful in that way, strength to strength, it's no longer weakness to weakness. It's no longer the drudgery of digging a hole here and digging a hole here and hoping that it'll happen. It is that the consistency in my life of, of, of leaving something behind for someone else in the worst day of my life that I'm still concerned that I'm leaving something good for somebody else. Here's the pilgrim who has his heart toward God. Listen how it ends. Each one appears before God in Zion. In other words, this pilgrim's going to show up, and he's going to show up in front of God. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Let's just think about that for a moment. These people who dug that hole had no idea whether it was going to work or not, and they still dug the hole. They had no idea whether what they were doing in their life was going to turn around, turn around and be right. They had no idea that they were going to bless somebody else. They just kept doing it. If you're going through weeping, if you're having a tough time, if it's your valley of Baca, God has something for you in it. Hold on tight. Here's um, Ephesians just for a moment. Change the way you're thinking. Think his thoughts. Ephesians 3. This was a benediction in the early church. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, if you use those together, you realize, mm, huge. Able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Everyone in this room knows that life should be better, that your life ought to be better, that life around us ought to be better. Everybody knows that the world ought to be better than the news that we hear every night. Every one of us know that there is a heaven prepared for us and that there is change coming. Every one of us know that God meant this to be better than what we have it today. Here's that scripture again, rewritten this time in the message. God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it by not pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. And then it ends with this affirmation. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah in Jesus. Glory down all generations. Glory through all millennial Oh, yes. Amen. If you're going through something today, God has something better for you. If you're struggling in life, if it hurts, if there's pain involved, God has something better for you. Hold on. It's coming. If you wouldn't mind standing with me and we'll pray together. Hmm. You have no rival. You have no equal. There is zero we can compare you to, just like that song said. They're not even close can we come to what you want. When you say, when your scripture says exceedingly, abundantly, beyond our wildest dreams are your hopes and dreams for us and in us. Today, Father, we pray for your blessing. May we see your hand of mercy in our lives. May we walk with you and have relationship with you. In your name we pray, amen. Give him the glory this morning. We all will worship you and praise you. So, we want to do a couple of things this morning. With the Lord, with the one that gives you more abundantly than you will ever imagine. I think this is the right moment. You can do it by singing if you like. Thank you for watching. If you want more information about our church ministries, come and visit us at 67 and a half April Wind South, Highway 105 in Montgomery, Texas, or call our church office at 936-588-2832. You can visit our website at www.aprilsound.org or follow us on social media. April Sound Church, a family-friendly community church.